you're like, okay, we're gonna turn a live bar into an adventure touring bike. What do we have to do to get this done? Previously on the Harley Davidson podcast. We had a deadline, so we had to move. So it was a bit of a, you know, round the clock, full court press to get the bikes ready. It looked like this really cool adventure bike. We just couldn't believe it. I remember we, by the time we got to the top of the hill, we, des we decided this is the bike for us, you know. We just got off, we'd ridden it for about 10 minutes. We got off and went, oh, this is it. Let's do this, let's do this. It really was um, fun to get back on the open road again. You know, and those first, that first sort of week or so as, as you felt the whole of all your woes and, and worries and troubles and everything all starting to fall away and the two of us sort of heading off up this road on this great big adventure, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was lovely to be together again. It really was. Welcome to the Harley Davidson Podcast, Long Way Up Edition, a six part series where we dive into the epic 13,000 mile trip taken by Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman that took them from Ushuaia, South America up to Los Angeles and all on electric Harley Davidson live wires. In this episode, the Long Way Up crew and the team at Harley Davidson discuss planning the journey, getting the bikes to Argentina, their early challenges and hitting the open road. Here's Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman. What's, what's really fun about these adventures is figuring out where you want to go, you know, what route you want to take, what kind of stuff you need. You, you look up and find out what other people do and what they take and stuff like that. But I think the idea is to have a good idea of where you'd like to go and, and, and not not to have a, a solid route, but, but, but just think, well, if I'm going to go to Chile and these places, these are the places I'd like to go. And then you can just muddle your way to to go in those in those kind of directions. You know, it's just like Charlie says, just lovely to think about it, planning it, daydreaming about it, then finding yourself on the trip. And you do have ups and downs. You're bound to. You're sort of out of your comfort zone. And that's the beauty of it. That's why you're doing it. You're out there in places that you wouldn't normally find yourself in. Decisions do have to be made. And especially here with, you know, the nature of charging the bikes, there was a certain amount of extra planning for that. This trip was different, I think, for two reasons. One, the four of us had changed a bit and had connected in this band of brothers sort of style. And therefore there was just a different, but positive and great energy between the four of us, four blokes hanging out, trying to do something crazy. Russ Malkin, producer, director. And then of course, the other thing that was different was going electric and all the stuff that were inherently difficult with regard to that. Cause I think had we gone petrol, it would have been easy. And it was nice to have made that challenge. We love petrol and gas-powered motorcycles too. We love them all. I'm not creating a class system of one being better than another. It's different, but the advantages or the positives are insane. David Alexanian, I am one of the directors and producers of Long Way Up. You know, the electric thing for us was, I mean, it's a performance proposition. The environmental benefits are a lovely kicker, but once you get on an electric motorcycle or electric vehicle, I don't know if it's the, the way they're set up or the, you know, the low down weight or, you know, the power delivery, it's game changer for me. I, I love it. And it didn't matter what I thought, truly. I never put anybody under any pressure. You and Charlie make this call, you know, Russ and I don't decide that. Um, and they don't bluff. You know, those guys either love something or it's not interesting. And they love, Ewan was like, Charlie, at one point he said to Charlie, I mean, I think we got it on camera. He's like, Charlie, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm getting my Harley tattoo tonight, man. We're doing this thing on Harley. So their expression was clear. They loved it. I mean, I think if people like like the series, they, they get into the fact that we're genuine, you know? I mean, I, I, I don't think, you know, in the same way that we don't want to suggest that we're now these sort of, you know, eco warriors um, and perfect. We also don't want to suggest that, you know, we're the most hardcore travelers because obviously there are a lot of individuals there, are, you know, guys who just are men and women who wake up in the morning and they say, screw it, I'm going to, you know, pack a thermos and a sandwich and I'm going to go. So those are the guys who are really out there and we have an immense amount of respect for them. And I, I really want that to be communicated to everybody. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who do this alone or do it with one other person. But I, I'd never liked this term support team because we're not really there to support you and Charlie. We're there to film them. You know, nobody's riding any of that for you and Charlie. I mean, they're riding every inch of it. And then if we don't ride and we put it on a 
ferry or a plane, we show you. We, we've typically rolled out our front door and got on the trip. The fact that we mobilized everything at the southernmost tip of Argentina was unique. So the prep changed pretty dramatically. That made it trickier. So there are a lot of there are a lot of differences. But the cool thing about the group of us, the four of us, um, and then also guys like Claudio, we have a rhythm. You know, we have an unspoken language, and we're lucky to have it. So in that way, it was the same. It's like meeting old friends again. You know, if you have friends from school, you might not see them for years, but because you were very good friends before, you you meet them, and it's like before. My name is. Uh... Claudio von Planta, I'm a director of photography. The decision was for me on the filming side to still keep me on a normal combustion engine bike. So they decided to give me a roadster. And we, we knew as well on the electric bikes, you need to be careful with your speed. If you go too fast, you burn your, your, your battery, you burn it down too fast. And so for the filming, for me, it's important that I can race ahead and set up the camera and film them passing by or, you know, I then hang back, but I can catch up and I don't have to worry about the speed. I can just go as fast as I like, which is cool. So it's exactly what I needed. So it was definitely the right, the right choice for me with the camera to have more flexibility. We were able to do it with Claudio Van Planta, Jimmy Simak, real talents. Uh, we were lucky enough to bring on another guy called Anthony Sec and a guy called Taylor Estevez. You know, that team really, really made it happen in terms of shooting it. This project definitely had many logistics involved. The bikes were a piece of it. Just a lot of things that happen that you don't expect along the way. My name's Jenny Lowney, title Lead Entertainment Integration. There were other things as far as any employee needed to get the proper clearance. Some people had to get vaccinations to go where we're going to go. Traveling from the tip of South America through Central America to the U.S., like on an electric motorcycle, obviously there's going to be some logistical things that need to be thought through beforehand. I'm Rebecca Adami, and I work in go-to-market. We're gonna need help making sure logistically everyone's set up properly to go down there and that there's a touch point back and forth from the company to the people down there, that there's parts that they need, there's communication. We just needed to be on site in case there was a technician that was needed for the bikes. And then we needed to make sure that we had clearances to get over all those borders. And then we had to make sure that if, if there were any software updates to Livewire, you know, those can come very quickly. So we needed to make sure that the bikes were getting those software updates as well. There was a rough draft schedule, like you would at any trip of like, we're gonna hit this place at this date and time. But what you never can plan for is what may happen along that way and route. And if the production team filming in Rivian, if they have any issues, then we're gonna have to like deviate from that as well. I would say the biggest logistical hurdle that we had to get over was the range of the motorcycles. They had a number of uh, set miles that they wanted to get through every single day, and we needed to be sure that our bikes were going to be able to get them there. So as we were planning with them, one of the things that came up was actually uh, Long Way Up Productions working with the different um, governments and different towns and countries that they were going to be going through and working with Rivian to get chargers installed along the route so that the team could get as many miles as they needed to get in because they needed to be done with this ride in early December. The crazy part I feel like was working through all the different like business visas and all the different governments because you're traveling um, and having all the right paperwork for the motorcycles. In order to get the bikes ready to leave for Argentina, we needed to make sure that everything with, with the bike was either disconnected as far as the battery goes. You know, shipping a lithium battery was also something that we had to navigate through. We were literally bringing parts to the bikes while they're getting ready to get shipped. And in certain cases, we had to, you know, pack up a lot of spares too, so it was hectic. Jim Federico, VP of Engineering at Harley Davidson. The good news is they ended up basically boxing these up, crating them up in Chicago. And they they left from Chicago and then headed out west before they, uh, you know, were put on a cargo plane to ship these 
to the beginning of the run. And that includes uh, two trucks. So uh, a couple motorcycles, a lot of spare parts, and uh, a couple EV trucks, Rivian trucks. It was hectic. We were going back and forth with Rivian, getting things done. Their uh, site in, in uh, Michigan. And so we have people running back and forth between Milwaukee and Michigan. Um, but it worked. It was last minute. One of the issues we had is obviously the prototypes. We couldn't necessarily fly these these vehicles into Argentina. I mean, Argentina is very difficult anyway. They're very controlling of imports. So here we are trying to import things that didn't really have proper registration or VIN numbers. Nobody really knew what the hell they were. This was all so new for any country that we were going through. And so then you have to go through customs. And we had uh, Rachel Wildy and another engineer that basically almost went on the similar flights along with the cargo flights that met, the, met our bikes. I had the opportunity to go down and see the shooting of Long Way Up, as well as see the adventures that, that, that you and Charlie actually got to have, but ours were a different version. It was the Harley version of the Long Way Up and what we actually did. I'm Rachel Wildy. I am an engineering manager over EV Special Projects. The idea of us being down there was more so from the standpoint of these were not production bikes, they were prototypes. So we wanted to make sure that we were working on them from a powertrain, from a battery standpoint. And so we wanted to make sure that they had trained technicians down there. Rachel and I were actually the first two on the scene as we went down to Ushuaia, which was our first starting location. My name is Ryan Kelly. I work at the Product Development Center, and my title is Senior Technical Specialist. We stopped at Buenos Aires. As we're sitting there, we go to kind of wander over to the gate, and we kind of are looking at around who's going to be on the plane, and we realize, wait, there's Charlie, there's Ewan, there's the production crew. And so we're, we're, we, we're like, all right, I guess we are in the right spot. And our next plane was to Ushuaia, which is the southernmost portion of South America. It's nighttime, you come over these snow-capped mountains, you land and the city is off into the, the mountain hillside. The next morning after we woke up to the hotel, we wake up to being on the Beagle Channel. And the Beagle Channel is what Darwin went through as he was rounding around the tip of South America. So we ended up staying right, right there. It has to be one of the most gorgeous places ever. You've got ocean on one side, mountains on the other. The Argentinian people are fantastic. They were very welcoming. That particular area being called Terro del Fuego meant end of the world. So it was kind of cool to see people having posters up for, I guess, the travelers that make it down there to have a picture taken where you can say, I've, I've made it this far. It was really gorgeous. Uh, I'd say about mid 50s. So we're thinking, oh, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be a good time. We're going to be able to get our stuff. And we're going to go on. You know, we had to do some pre-delivery type of work on it, put our windshields on, put on some of the brush bars. And right as we were taking them for a test ride, I kind of started to get this wet, frozen moisture hitting. And uh, I went, huh, look at that. I think it's starting to snow. And it didn't just snow you know, like a dusting. It snowed almost two feet. So now the roads are sloshy and, and are on top of the fact that the roads already are not paved roads in most cases, they're just raw dirt roads. And so we're riding in snow gear and taking it on and off roads to make sure it could handle what it was doing. Ewan and Charlie were at one hotel while we were at a different hotel. And for the first real trip over there, the road that we were on, I don't even think someone could have walked. It was so rough and so muddy and so slippery that there were times we were almost lost the truck, you know, going onto this. And so all of us, you know, including Ewan and Charlie, are looking at this and saying, how are we gonna get the bikes through this, they they even at one point were talking about switching tires to an off-road like dirt bike type of tire to get through this terrain. And, you know, through some, you know, conversation, we decided to stick with the tires that we were already on it. But it was so bad that all of us were worried about it in the initial run of it. 
we unveiled the bikes. They were like kids in a, in a candy store or kids at Christmas time enjoying that. You and I were sitting in this um, freezing cold warehouse uh, unpacking these bikes and, and, and I think we'd realized that, that we'd only ridden them for about an hour, an hour and a half in total. And so, and we were sort of sitting there thinking, you know, how long does it take to charge? And, and you know, how long, how far can we go? And, and you know, so all of these questions were, were coming about. So we certainly didn't make it easy for ourselves. No, it's true. No, we literally had ridden them here in LA. So we had no, like Charlie said, no experience of charging this bike. How does it, how long is it going to take? What's the difference between charging it from a socket in the wall versus a fast charger, a phase two charger? What does that do? It was a really steep learning curve in the freezing cold, uh, you know, in the snow. That's where we started. Worst winter since 1974. <laughs> 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 it was just extraordinary. Then they said, okay, now we'd like to install the camera, the audio and the video on the bikes. And they're like, okay, we need this mount, we need this product part, we need this put on, we need other items that they had sourced and said, oh, this would be great, can you make it work? And what we ended up doing is just outside of the, um, the facility that we were working in was a, a boat graveyard. There's old cranes, there's old boats, there's old cars, there's old parts. We would go out to the graveyard, look for something that we could use, you know, cut it off, rip it off, do whatever we need, bring it back to our area and sort of fab it up right off the stop. And I look at it and I'm like, oh shoot, this, this is not gonna work. I need to form it to how I need. And so I go and find a just big piece of metal and I use one of the downed cranes and I put my, put my piece on it, started grabbing the bigger piece of metal and then started anviling the part into the shape that I needed. So I was making this part and as raw as you can possibly get with a grinder, an extra piece of metal, and what I part I needed that I'd just taken off of some scrap part and then formed it, painted it, shaped it, and got it on the bike so we could, I think it might have been a camera mount or something that we were requiring on the spot right before, days before we're going on this you know, trip. So not only does the part have to look good because you want in case it gets on camera, you have to make sure it can last this whole way. <laughs> Our biggest challenges really here were uh, cold. You know, we started off when it was still winter down in Ushuaia, and I think it's probably never very warm down there, whatever time of year it is, but it was certainly really it was snowbound. Like we couldn't, we couldn't leave for the first week we were there because of snow. It snowed and snowed and snowed, which I will tell you was kind of a blessing because we were actually able to spend a couple more days preparing the bikes for the journey. For the most part, they were ready to go, but we had to do some tweaks to some of the wiring. We were still loading in new software up until the last minute. We knew we still had some some new parts coming down that had been shipped overnight, and we were, we were waiting. Shipping overnight from Milwaukee to the end of the world is uh, not overnight. It took about... I think four days for us to get a critical part that we wanted to put on the bikes. We worked some extremely long hours to make sure this adventure got started on the right foot. And it truly did. It set the pace for the, the rest of the trip. Finally, you, we, we started to head off on the bike. And, you know, the classic is you getting all your, we had to wear everything because it was so cold and it was the, the first blue sky day, wasn't it? And then we put all this on. And then, you know, you're sitting there and then of course, just as about to leave, you, someone comes out of the place where we were standing and says, you know, whose is this? And I remember it was mine. I remember thinking, where, where am I going to put it? I've got nowhere to put anything anymore. Our very first day out on the road, they went up the side of kind of up into a mountainous area and encountered everything. They encountered rain slush, mud, snow, and they were so happy about the tires that we picked. They said they had confidence. The whole bike felt tight and everything else. So they came back. They had smiles. I took the opportunity to quickly interview them so that I could get a little bit of feedback to the team that was back in the States. 
it was a complete relief after trying to convince them to go away from something that they had a lot of confidence in and go with our recommendations from the engineering organization. And and I think that was the day when um, we decided to we were going to we we're going to charge at that bakery that that um, that had those charges that we put in um, throughout the journey. We had it's like seventy miles seventy miles to this because Rivian. And their partners NL put in these this phase two charging stations like every 150 miles, 100 miles, because otherwise we couldn't have done the trip with the Rivians, you know. And we were determined to do so. Thanks to them, and um, we had these we had these uh, phase two charging stations along the route that we could also use. So, um, but they weren't always there for us if we if we veered off the route, which we did now and again, and the cars went one way, we went another. We would rely just on the on the on the generosity of strangers, and we'd plug in restaurants and hostels and hotels and whatever, which we did a lot. But on this first day, like Charlie said, there was a there was a bakery with one of these NL chargers at it. Um, I think seventy miles from where we left, and so you know that seventy miles was like a real eye opener. A, there was snow everywhere. Like we stopped to have a pee at one point, and we went off. That just you know, as you do, you you take your helmet off and you hang it on the wing mirror, and off you go into the woods and I just went over the side of the snowbank and disappeared into the snow up to about here, like could hardly get out, you know. And um, that was our first day and that 70 miles of like, we're just talk constantly chatting, like what speed should we be at? Let's try 45. We're watching the, you know, you've got the GPS actual mileage to that charging station. You've got the bike that live wires telling you the projected mileage that it thinks it can do under these current circumstances. And um, you're trying to keep those figures together you know by using speed really is is, is main, mainly your the only tool you've got really to do that so we're just figuring all this out as we go and it and it did work for we got to we got to the bakery i think we had like 25 20 percent left maybe in the battery at that point plugged in spent three or four hours there and uh and uh, and then when we left we had 80 percent in the bike and it got us to the hotel that night we got late like we arrived at like nine o'clock or something freezing cold but we got there <laughs> yeah we got there you know, looking back on it you know that was one of the days you remember the most really you know those days when 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 you know you're super stressed or 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 things go wrong or something like that then then you know the time can be super frustrating but but um but when you look back at it now in the comforts of our own homes you know you can sort of giggle and laugh about it and those are the bits that you remember most fondly The fact that we were on electric bikes took people by surprise here. On the next episode of the Harley Davidson podcast, Long Way Up Edition. They are the first guys who did this trip on electric bikes. Every one of those early days and those early charges was a first. EV infrastructure is non-existent in South America. I don't think we quite realized, you know, what a challenge it would be. To make stuff easy is not really what we're about. The guys really became dialed in with the vehicles. We're like, can't we go into Bolivia in that border crossing that nobody ever takes? And like, next thing you know, we were taking it. That's when we almost always had our funniest times. Because we just start talking nonsense and singing songs and rub anything just to keep each other, just to keep our, our, ourselves and each other going. Catch new episodes of Long Way Up exclusively on Apple TV+. Plus.